about mission and vision, uh, we are trying to be really honest about some of the things that we know are challenges. Uh, all of our discussions that we're going to be hosting are talking about the blessings that we see around this place right now, that are, we're talking about the challenges we see around these, uh, this place right now, and we're talking about the hopes that we see around Holy Communion in this stage of our life. And we have some systems in this that we know have some serious blessing, some serious challenge, and we hope have some hope to them. And the organ is one of those principles. Um, just a little snapshot of the history of our organ. Some of the pipes in our organ are from the 19th century. Um, they're from an organ that was made by a company called Ferrand and Boti. Uh, and that is not a really, really big company. You might have heard of companies like Aeoli and Skinner. But Ferrand and Boti is, um, I will say, like an organ nerd's exciting name to hear. Uh, when we were having the organ evaluated, there were folks that said, oh, there's some really cool pipe work in here. Now, it's not the majority of the organ, but there is pipe work that's over 100 years old in this organ. The current organ, as it was currently set up, was built for another church building that Holy Communion had. Our original church buildings were down at the corner of Leffingwell and Washington in Mid-City in St. Louis. And so this organ was originally built down there. The congregation moved up to University Cities from the 1930s into the 1940s. For a while, the rector was getting on the streetcar in Del Mar every Sunday after services here and going down to Mid-City to do afternoon services down at Leffingwell in Washington. But in the process of moving the congregation up here, the organ was moved, and it was first installed in Mitchell Hall, which was our first chapel up here in University City. And then in the late 40s, early 50s, the organ was installed here. Um, when that happened, the Moeller company that had substantially rebuilt the organ at the um, beginning of the 20th century put more organ in and rebuilt it and put it in. Sometime around that period, we also got a new console. Um, that new console is one of the blessings of this organ. Uh, Mary Carroll, who was our organist for over 60 years, took exquisite care of this console. It's a beautiful piece of wooden furniture. Additionally, it has ivory keys. Um, which would be illegal today, but it's okay because they're historic and they're gorgeous. But it is just an absolutely beautiful shape. It's wonderful to play on the keyboards. The problem isn't on the keyboards, it's what happens in these rooms. Um, these two rooms, uh, behind where Scott and Roberta are, and then behind that second arch are where the pipes are. They're called pipe chambers. Um, there are shades between them, you'll see those at the end, that open and close. Um, those are called swell shades. And the pipe work lives in there. Um, it lives, pipes sit in big boxes. And those big boxes fill up with air. There's a whole bunch of leather involved in how that works. And the leather in our system is 70 plus years old. And anybody who has an old belt or an old pair of shoes can tell you what happens to leather over the years. Um, our organ has had good seasons of care and not so good seasons of care. And there is, are cracks and holes in a lot of places in the leather. I'm going to ask uh, Connor to just turn the organ on so that you can hear the sound that it makes. The organ, when you turn it on, if the room is quiet, you'll just hear a hissing. The choir hears it really loud behind them. And that's all the extra air escaping through holes in the leather work and escaping through holes where you, there used to be pipes. I'm going to let Connor talk to you a little bit about pipes and some of the issues that happen in our organ. But basically, know that the way that the contractions of the organ are set up, there's always air. And Connor's console, when he pushes the keys, there's a whole series of mechanical switches that go. And then it first opens the particular set of pipes. It starts pushing air into that particular set of pipes. And when he actually depresses a key, a magnet and a piece of leather pop open and let air go through a pipe. And it sounds something like this. So it's just right underneath there, and it opens up. I mean, that leather fails because of age, humidity, um, moisture, um, etc. And that becomes unfunctional. So for such a complex instrument, this is all the organ really is. It just sits on boxes of air. And then the console, now the mechanics, control how the air comes out. So our instrument is, um, 
mechanically obsolete at this point. Um, organs are not made like this organ is anymore. Um, it's, it consists of double cotton covered wire, which is almost ancient wire at this point. Um, and everything is run by air and pneumatics. Um, and all of those systems are very difficult to repair. Um, our organ consultant at this point is one of the only living persons who understands the system and is able to fix and repair it. Uh, but it is the repairs that are made to it at this point are not lasting. Um, <clears throat> there are some other issues about keeping the organ in tune. You'll notice that it doesn't tune very often. Um, if you have a sensitive ear to music, you can really pick up on that easily. Um, Part of the reason is because the room it exists in is not insulated well. It's uh, a concrete exterior wall, and in the summertime, the sun heats that room up because of the concrete, and then in the wintertime, the cold comes in through that exterior wall in that room. Um, so anytime it is tuned, it doesn't last for very long because the temperature fluctuates so much in that, in that room. There's another challenge with heating and cooling, and that is, for some reason, when the chapel was added onto the space and they added an HVAC system for the chapel, they piped that HVAC system through the organ chambers, um, which both adds to the heating and cooling problems because you're having sections of the room that are getting hotter or colder than the rest of the room and pulling the thing out of the um, tube. And you also get condensation on that, and so water is actually dripping onto our organ when AC is pouring into the chapel, which is really problematic. Ideally, the HVAC system from the chapel would not be in that room. Um, these pipes are made out of a tin and lead alloy, so they fluctuate already. They expand and contract with temperature already, so that just exacerbates the problem when we don't have a room that is climate controlled. Um, like I said, the wiring is very, very old and sometimes can shut off entire ranks of pipes. Each of the stops that you pull out, for instance, maybe like there's an eight foot oboe, and that's one specific sound of the 62 keys that are on the keyboard. Sometimes a whole stop will just stop working, and that's because of the ancient wiring system uh, that's in the console, but also that communicates to the rest of the organ itself. Um, and in general, our instrument hasn't really been well taken care of. Um, like Mike said, this instrument hasn't really been touched in a huge way um, since the mid-century. Uh, the one piece of work that I had done when I came here is we redid the swell shades, which opens and closes the sound, as if I were like talking here and then it opens up. And I'll demonstrate that at the end of this. So I'm going to go to the console now and show you some sounds um, that aren't so pretty. I try to hide them during service as best I can, but now I'm going to kind of take the veil off. Right? So let me demonstrate some poor tuning. Big double trumpet in the bass. 
It's been fixed a couple times since I've been here, but it's very So we're going to have to do something about the wiring in this space. 
There are other questions, though, about this room. They say the most important organ stop is the room it plays in. This carpet is not an ideal surface for an organ to be playing into. The way that we have cushions on the pews, those are pretty loose cushions. There's all sorts of questions we could be asking about how do we acoustically work on this room. Visually, too, pipe organs are a sign of pride for congregations. I would bet that if you surveyed new people to this congregation, a good percentage of them would have no idea we have a pipe organ. Because how would you know? There are no pipes visible. So what if we created a pipe box? Even if the pipes in that box were not playing pipes, you would know that there was a pipe organ, a really fine pipe organ, here at Holy Communion. These are the kind of opportunities we have in front of us with this instrument. Um, and I think they're important ones.